Welcome to another episode. Another episode, yes, hello. And welcome to another episode of Fuse 8 TV. Oh, the bugs in this system. I am again your beautiful host, Betsy Bird, and we are today seeing a very, very interesting guest today. In fact, a fantastic guest that I adore. As you can see, it is Rita Williams Garcia. Yes, indeed. You may know her from so many of the books that she has done, but most recently, you may know her from her fantastic third book in the Gaither Sister series, Gone Crazy in Alabama, a book that has gotten many, 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 many a starred review. More about Rita soon because she is fantastic. But in the meantime, you're stuck looking at me, this guy. Hello, because we are going to begin as, oh, by the way, note my bookcases are now full full of lovely books and a random uh, white circle on my ceiling that I don't know why that's there. I don't know. Um, so we're going to begin today with my favorite series, uh, which is reading too much into picture books. And today's book is uh, not as well known uh, to American audiences. Um, this is a series very popular, I believe in Britain, though it could be Australian. I don't know. This is what research. Um, this is the Mr. Croc series. Now, as you can see, uh, there are many, 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 many Mr. Croc books. Uh, didn't really catch on, and I don't know why. He is, I guess, considered the poor man's Maisie. Um, same sort of reading level, uh, same types of books. As you can see, um, they, they have this cool thing where they can, they sort of, like, move. This one's particularly cool because he, he moves quite, quite a lot, uh, in the course of this. This is his exercise one. And... The thing about Mr. Croc is it's sort of like if someone saw Maisie and was like, I like Maisie, um, could she have the potential to eat her friends more? And now we have that because they always end the same way with Mr. Croc going uh, snappy, snap, snap, snap. Um, I don't know why he does this. And maybe this is why he didn't catch on in America quite so much. Uh, but he always has this like snap, 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 where he like comes right out at your child, um, which sometimes they enjoy. The problem with Mr. Croc is the problem with all picture books. You read them enough times as a parent, and you begin to read them with a very adult perspective. Um, this is the problem with everything for children, uh, from Sesame Street to Mr. Rogers to, uh, you know, not well, Daniel Tiger to a certain extent, um, where you begin to uh, make relationships where no relationships exist. And I found usually that's a stretch. You're like, Maybe these two people are getting together. And usually you're like, yeah, I'm just reading too much into it. But not with Mr. Croc. Mr. Croc, I have created a whole alternative world with Mr. Croc. And it all focuses on Wilf here. Wilf, it's like a wolf, but his name's Wilf. Wilf, apparently his full name would be Wilf Wolf. I don't know why. Um, as you can see, here's Wilf. Wilf, as we have learned from other Mr. Croc books, and this is unfair because I'm bringing outside books into this discussion, other Mr. Croc books, Wilf is, um, he's more working class. When he has a job, he's a farmer. Or he does something very, you know, rude and um, As opposed to Lulu. Lulu, as you can see right here, with her tennis whites, is, uh, well, she's a little upper class. And the thing is, the, okay, first of all, notice who she's looking at. She's looking at Wilf. This is very consistent with the series. Lulu and Wilf have a thing going on. It's totally true. And people are like, you're reading too much into this. No, I'm not. I'm not reading too much into this. First of all, in each one of these books, here's Lulu again. Um, in each one of these books, you can, uh, they, they have to, each one of them gets to win a sport. What you notice when you read this book enough times is that the only reason the Wilf doesn't win all the sports is because he recuses himself. So as you can see, he's just sitting on the sidelines for this one. This is kind of cool, by the way. Um, Mr. Wolf is playing tennis and you get to go, Bruh! I love this book. It's, I think it's out of print in America, but if you can get your hands on it, it's totally worth it. Um, also, again, uh, Wilf is doing the time here, so it's your reason. When Wilf does actually participate in a race of some sort, he's carrying Lulu. That's the only reason he didn't win this race, was because he was carrying Lulu, who apparently can't walk anymore, even though she's a freaking leopard. Um, this is how they run, by the way. Oh, so cool. So anyway, as you go through it, he finally gets to write, you know, do his own, and of course he wins the cycling race because he's awesome. And uh, and then here he recuses himself by doing this. So you read through these enough times and it is clear. First of all, she's always looking at him. 
always. I mean, if she had partly the reason, yeah, you know, when she's, you know, doing anything, and he's looking at her too, um, they clearly have a thing going on. Um, and then you get to the end, uh, and who's standing together? Uh, <laughs> so that is, I think, maybe one of the clearest definitions of Betsy reading way too much into a very simple but awesome uh, series. So we've gone beyond just my objections to the children in Where's, Where's Waldo, and we've gone into my interpersonal, interspecies relationships of Mr. Croc. Yay. So, today, my darlings, we have a very special guest. I will go back to the, uh, the screen in which you can see her, her lovely visage. Um, actually, here's the thing. Here's one lovely visage, but I discovered uh, not too long ago, that there is yet another uh, lovely visage of her. And I don't know if this is coming up or not for you, um, but this is Rita Williams Garcia as Wonder Woman uh, with knitting, which is fantastic. Uh, Ingrid Sundberg apparently did this for a whole bunch of people. But as you can see, Rita Williams Garcia is the author of Gone Crazy in Alabama, which star, 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 uh, is an amazing book and one that I certainly hope uh, you will all check out soon. So welcome Rita Williams Garcia to our, our show today. Well, thank you for having me. So I have many, many questions for you. Um, partly this, this talk assumes that people have a read your previous book, uh, all three, I mean, all three in the Gaither Girls series to a certain extent. If people have not, um, they need to do so and this will all make more sense. But uh, I think to a certain extent, a lot of what the books talk about um, really speaks to a universal experience, and that is having sisters. And not just having sisters, but this deeply authentic way in which one has sisters. But before we get into that, um, how does it feel to finally end the series? Um, well, um... Ah, uh, it's, it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. It's so hard to say goodbye to my sisters here. Um, mainly, I, I guess, well, okay, the, the easy part is that I didn't really know it was going to be a series. So, so it's not like I was saying to myself, okay, so here are three books, and then at the end, I'm going to cry a lot. It was first there was One Crazy Summer, and then um, and then PSB 11 came. It kind of came to me in the middle of One Crazy Summer, and then I knew the story had a, one more leg to go, and and so then the the tissues the kleenex came out um but um i would say that you don't necessarily have to read one and two to really know the book um because a lot of my a lot of my readers are writing to me and saying oh i love this book and then it becomes clear to me they've not read the previous ones so i get the joy of telling them well you can read One Crazy Summer or PSB 11, and it's then jewel all around, you know? So, so I feel very good about that, yay! And it's true, actually, yeah, you call it the leg in the series, but I have spoken to, we, we tested this out, of course, with my librarians, and we were like, we gave it specifically to librarians who had not read one and two, which was not an easy proposition. <laughs> um, finding them, you have to really track them down to a certain extent. And, uh, get the, you have to get the newbies, basically, and be like, Arr! um and, uh, and we said to them, like, does it make sense? Did, did you get it? They were like, yeah, it makes total sense. So it really does stand on its own, which is very good for award season. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, so if anyone should wonder, it stands on fine on its own. <coughs> um, ah, yes. So uh, getting back into the sibling relationships, which are real and raw, and nobody writes them uh, like you at all. Uh, they're almost they're almost painful in their in their authenticity. I think they are probably painful. I don't know. I actually, I found them painful as a older sibling, which is so funny because. Uh, you can definitely read them as a case of older sibling bullying. Um, but I'm reading these books and I'm like, 
why won't the younger sisters listen to her? And I'm an older sister, so I'm sure people who are younger sisters read this on an entirely different level. Um, but where did you get the sister relationship? Do you have sisters? Did you did you birth them? What did, where, where did this come from? <laughs> well, um, uh, okay, so I am the youngest of, of three, and there's a brother in between us. Um, and and so a lot of it has to be, yeah, I, I guess imagine. Um, but uh, we have our fair amount of of um, forming alliances and uh, going to war against the older, powerful, da, 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 big sister, you know, um, and then the other two will turn on the adorable younger sister um, and and call her mommy's favorite. I don't know why they say that. Um, <laughs> so so that kind of the present tense for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, so, you know, so kind of understanding how the roles work, the, the middle child and, and how um, they sometimes form alliances and then they fall out and, and how the older sister can be seen, especially to the youngers as the bully, but she doesn't see it that way. No, 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 no. She's just keeping them safe for democracy. <laughs> yes, exactly, it's justice, justice. That's the whole reason you were put on this globe. And it's so funny because I am the oldest of three siblings with the brother in the middle as well. So we're coming at this from a very, and yet you wrote the older sister point of view so perfectly. I would have assumed you were a fellow oldest sister. No, 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 this is, you're the youngest. It's, it's trickery of the writing craft. It's all trickery. You cannot see the things going on behind me, but I tell you, they're all at work. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I, I guess I study people and I sit around thinking, why this, why that? And then I imagine things on top of that. And, and it's always what's at the heart of the person, what's important to them. So if I have a character like Delphine and she's very responsible and, and she is so, for, you, you know, she's so genuine, um, I have to know how to poke holes at that through the younger characters, the younger <laughs> sisters, because life is unfair to everybody. So we have to kind of make that equal opportunity. Um, That's a good line. That's gonna be my takeaway. Life is unfair to everybody. <laughs> I think I got that from the end of the theme song from Malcolm in the Middle of <laughs> Life is Unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Yet another mention of Malcolm in the Middle on this show. Why don't know? Um, it's, it replies to everything. Um, okay, so uh, respect for Alabama, which nobody has. In fact, when I read the title of your book, and this is a bad thing to confess, every single time I read the title, I hear the Nina Simone song, uh, Mississippi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this, this being a PG show, we, we can't say the name, but it begins with Alabama's got me so upset. Uh, Tennessee makes me lose my rest. And everybody knows about it, Mississippi. Mm. Um, so nobody has any respect for Alabama, but this book has infinite respect for Alabama. Um, do you have a connection to Alabama in some way? No. <laughs> Writing. Writing, it's the trickery involved, the, the finding the right place. Um, um, it, it, it's just that Alabama is so rich and it, give, it gave me that opportunity to really bring together um, a history of Native Americans be, uh, because of the, the, um, because of, um, the Creek population um, in uh, Alabama and to also have that very rich antebellum South of Southern um, history. So you could bring all of those three things together under this book and tell what I think is an authentic American story, um, which I, I, I don't think we're really talking about how we are all very much connected, how our stories come together. Uh, so I wanted to do that. Oh, like poor Vanetta says, you mean we're white? You know, And then the, the next minute she's, yes, 
I am Indian. Back then, they didn't say Native American, you know. And and, and then um, and then before and the father is telling them at the beginning of the story, uh, none of that, um, none of that soul and black power thing. So you get that sense of uh, of that um, Benetta can be everything and anything that she wants to be, you know. Um, and and um, and I think that's more of a reality for young people today. Uh, young people of um, uh, mixed ethnicities because they are so many different things and it's very hard to pull from who um, who am I and how do I identify well I'm a person um, and I have all of these I have all of these um, these stories all of these ancestors all of these different crossings and I think that is becoming more and more the American story and so I thought I would tell that through this past story nicely put. Um, huh, very good. It's funny. I, uh, I, one of, you know, I, I'm reminded for some reason of, um, that old story about when Laurence Olivier met, I think it was Dustin Hoffman and he was, uh, playing like Richard III and he put like a big stone in his shoe, uh, so he could get the limp right. And Laurence Olivier was like, my dear boy, have you tried acting? acting. And, and so here I am and they're like, what's your personal experience with Alabama? It's like, my dear girl, have you tried writing? <laughs> You know, people do. They take experiences not their own, and they put them into things. I mean, yes, you also take experiences you have, but you also take things that fit the narrative in as well. Um, however, you did have grandparents. I'm pretty sure about that. And the grandparents in this book, I have never seen grandparents like this before, um, and I like it. Um, but I take it that you did not have equivalent grandparents to the ones in this book yourself. Um, but did you have a great, a grandmother or a great grandmother? Uh, I guess these are great grandparents actually. A great grandmother who uh, had any similarity to the characters that you have written. That's all the, that's the writing going on behind me. Um, I, I do not let people into the dark cloak. I let them <laughs> believe that I'm telling my semi-autobiographical, no, my grandmothers were nothing like that. Um, <laughs> my, um, although my, let's see, my my paternal grandmother, who I spent the most time with, um, a grandma Edie. Um, you know, she was uh, well. She um, she was raised in the South, and but she, uh, she had a very uh, very different um, personality and and way of looking at things and. And she was a genteel Southern lady who became a genteel Southern Black Jewish lady um, through her adopted Jewish families. Um, and then there is my my uh, grandmother on my mother's side, who scared me because she was a giant and she had these big breastuses and and she chased us around the farm um, with with a tree branch. Now that's something uh, that that. Uh, that that comes from my uh, maternal grandmother, but she was the sweetest person ever. She was a she was a very maternal person, um, uh, but we were scared of her because she was big. And then later we learned that oh, she was four feet eleven. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, that's, that's very much my experience as well. I had the grandmother who was like in my mind, like there, and then the big towering with the and the hair on the top of her head, and she was six feet twelve. And no, I think she was my height now, and but she had this towering presence. So unfortunately, I had to, um, I had to invent the stories. Um, their their life stories and their um, their parents' life stories. Uh, my my family story, my family's history is completely different. Uh, um, am, am I ruining it? Um, no, it's all true. Ma Charles and Miss Trotter, it's all true. It's all true. Yeah, this is so good. So when you write your fictionalized memoir, then we can talk about things that way. And you oh, will you will be doing at some point in verse, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> We're looking forward to that. <laughs> make no, I make no promises. <laughs> I do. Um, one thing we mentioned, we, you mentioned a little earlier, and I, I meant to backtrack to it, and then I hadn't yet. Uh, so you mentioned, of course, Black Panthers and all that. I believe, and here's where it all breaks down. If this is not true, uh, I believe you are in a documentary on the Black Panthers that is currently playing in theaters. Is this true? 
this is true this is Woo! so true um i have seen myself on the big screen and it is daunting but i'm i was grateful to uh to play a small part um in that um as a matter of fact I hold before you um, the poster, the official poster, well, in postcard form of the Black Panthers um, Vanguard uh, movie. Yes, yay, all power to the people. Um, yeah, and I did my Q and A. Um, the, the movie is moving on um, to um, uh, to Boston and and to twenty one cities. Um, so it, it's, it was just a good opportunity to share this story and uh, there is a good deal of it that I think um, teachers um, can use in conjunction with the book. Um, maybe not the whole thing, but a good deal of it. So. Yay, very good, very good. Um, so of course with the end of the series, this is the end of uh, an extended, you tended to do quite a bit of young adult and this was a bit of a, a younger, uh, take for you. Um, not that you hadn't done middle grade before, uh, no laughter here, but uh, you've never done this extended children's thing before. Are you going to continue writing for children or are you interested in getting back more into the YA theory? Hmm. One never knows. Okay, I do know. Um, so I am actually right now I am um, I'm uh, working hard on a middle grade um, Book called Clayton Bird Goes Underground. I like and that little name. It's yes. <laughs> and uh, and it's for it's it's for a reader who wants to read, but they don't want to read all the time. You know that this um, it's not it's, they're they're developing readers still, um, but but they have they have the intellect. Um, and and they want to read stories um, of experience, but uh, you know, still building the muscles. Um, and so it's it's kind of hip hop meets the blues, and it's uh, and there is there is a grief story. But um, I, I have to say, I'm I am enjoying writing the story, um, learning to play the harmonica. A little something that um, that Pam Munoz Ryan and I have uh, of Echo Fame, and I have in common. We carry our, uh, we tend to carry our harmonicas with us, um, except I call mine a blues harp. Um, uh, so, so yes, so that's on the horizon. That's the next one, and um, I won't say that I'm done with the older, um, the older teen novel. We shall see. Stay tuned. Okay, very nice. Though now I'm having visions of the children's literature author harmonica band of you, Pam Muniz Ryden, Norton Juster. There's a whole bunch of them. Oh, uh, yeah. I think it'd be the greatest band of all time. <laughs> let's, let's make this happen in some way. I don't know how. <laughs> I, I have a dream now. I like it. <laughs> Wonderful. Ah, oh, well, this is great and so much information my goodness me um thank you so much for for stopping by and, and saying howdy to us well you are so welcome and thank you for inviting me to um be part of the program not even a problem so let me see if i can bring up your info here this is high tech stuff we're doing here. So yes, there we go. So Rita Williams Garcia is, as you might recall, the author of Gone Crazy in Alabama. Also brought to you by HarperCollins Children's Books. HarperCollins Children's Books, uh, one of the leading publishers of children's books, home to many of the classics of children's literature, including these many, 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 many imprints that you can see before you. Also brought to you by School Library Journal. Remember, you can get your School Library Journal on your iPad. It is School Library Journal on the go, something that is very easy to do. Thank you so much for watching today's show. If you are curious about our archived episodes, uh, I think we're missing one or two at the moment, but they will be updated quite soon. So you can go to fuse8tv.com, and there you can see all the uh, different episodes of authors that we have illustrated, and not illustrated, but talked to so far. So thank Thanks so much, Rita, and thanks everyone for watching. All right.